Hi, my name is Susan Lucas, and today I'd like to talk to you about the legislation that the Department of Defense has proposed to Congress for the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023. Uh, it really is a big piece of law. Uh, it goes many pages, goes into a lot of detail. And um, as I got into it, I found that they really are trying to um, not be held by the way things have always been, but perhaps put together a force uh, with personnel systems and organization that are a little bit different. I mean, who could resist the opportunity to basically start fresh and not be held back by the as is? Um, so you certainly can't uh, fault them for that. The Probably the biggest thing with this is that it is so big. I'm not really quite sure that it can get through this year. So this year we're in the 117th second session. Um, it's already June. The committees have already been marking up for a while. The NDAA came a little, a little bit later, a little bit further down into the year. And it has so much in it that it would not surprise me at all if Congress didn't pass it this year. That's not to say that they're not going to pass it and that they don't like it. I think what it really harkens more to the fact that they will wait until the 118th when they have two new years of a Congress to really delve into all of the details. It will give them a chance to have hearings. It will give them a chance for staff to sit there and um, discuss from uh, other Pentagon staff. It'll help congressional staff to Pentagon staff uh, get into it, look at the different parts because you can't just take it as a whole. I mean, it really is so detailed. It's one of those where you're going to go, you know, section by section by section by section. And the reason you do that is because they are changing things. You have to look and say, okay, this is what you're changing. This is what you intend to do, but are there going to be any unintended consequences? And that's really what happens in law a lot, is you want to avoid the unintended consequences. Quite obviously, you can't do that because you can't anticipate everything that's gonna come up. So your next best thing is to say, okay, I want to uh, avoid unintended consequences or uh, certainly as much as possible. So that means I need to write a law that is, is written in a way that it is flexible so that when things change, the law doesn't have to change with it. The law is flexible enough in the way that it's written that the details of how it's executed, which can be changed, are in, are in regulations, guidance, and things like that. So that's really the best law. The best law gives you the framework for what you want to do. The details come in uh, by the agency that puts it together, and that is the part that changes more not the law, but the law does change. Now, we've seen that with the GI Bill. We've seen that with, you know, other big pieces of law. You can't have law that big and not change. But what you hope to do is minimize the change that ends up occurring. So let's get into it uh, as we go through. Obviously, I'm not going to go section by section because it's one, it's like, who really wants to do that? Um, and there's no way it could be done in a short amount of time. So I want to just cover the highlights of what I found when I was going through it. Um, I think the, and oh, by the way, the law went over, the proposed law went over to Congress uh, one April, 2022. So probably the um, the biggest part of it, the, the, the statement that, you know, foretells everything is that it establishes the space component, which includes all members, units and organization currently in the regular Space Force and Air Force Reserve. So right now, remember the Space Force is for the most part resident in the Air Force. So what that statement is saying, and it's really a big statement. It seems like it's a little statement, but it's really a big statement because it says they're gonna take all the members, units and organization currently in the Air Force and bring it over into Space Force. Once it's in Space Force, it'll become the space component. They did say that it is going to be voluntary and that individuals who do not want to leave the Air Force and go over to Space, uh, space Force and become uh, a guardian, they will take care of that. 
normally they take care of that with uh, early separations, attrition, things like that. Probably the telling point of the statement is you notice it does not include a statement saying that the Air National Guard is going to come over with this. So they are leaving that part of it out. And in part, they're leaving it out because that's still under discussion. There is a, a law that has been introduced that establishes a separate um, air, uh, National Guard space. And so we'll, we'll see that for the most part, the law that is submitted talks about um, the federal forces. When they go on to describe uh, what they're putting together, because as, as you know, there's a preamble to it all, what they talk about is they want to remove traditional barriers. Um, and that really does um, um, explain a lot of what they ended up doing. Um, they, they believe that, and as, you, as anybody that's worked legislation will know, Title X does have some, um, some problems with it that make it harder to manage and use your force. And so what they're trying to do is overcome some of that. So more of the statements that they use that explain what they're doing in, um, in, in their proposals coming forward is um, they want mobilized assets to be continuously integrated. Probably the easiest way to understand that because as you know, these words sometimes are so, so generic that it's like, well, what the heck did you really mean? In this case, mobilized assets continually integrated, they're really talking about the Air Force uh, Reserve and active duty associate model, which is, you know, it's not a separate reserve unit. It's not a separate Air Force unit. It's an uh, uh, active unit. It's an active unit with uh, reserve manpower as part of it. So, so in that regard, it's not an, I mean, they kind of say it's a new, new system, but it's not, it's, it's what we know as the associate unit. They want to reduce transitions between full and part-time. Everybody has wanted that. They want to increase permeability to recruit critical um, skills and retain uh, that, what they see as they see themselves as a very technical workforce. And even in one part of it, they say we're, we're science, we're math, we're technology. Uh, everybody is. Um, they want officers to receive a single appointment. Um, that's kind of a big thing. That was, that's been discussed before, but there was a constitutional perspective of it. And in this document, they say they've overcome it. And the reason they've overcome it in their mind is because they are not asking for a separate reserve component. They are asking for the reserve, what we know as the reserve or the part-time or the part part time, but that uh, I'll explain that a little bit further. So they really have an active duty, which is three tiered, um, three ways with participation. You have the full time active, uh, the individual who may do more, and then the minimum. So the the one who does it more in the middle is the one who, you know, as as we know, is done today is called up based on operational needs. You know, augments exercises. Um, is deployed for a shorter period than active. That, but what's unusual in this case is they want it all to be active. That's how they can get around this, you know, officers receiving a single appointment. Now we have a regular and reserve appointment, but if we don't have reserve anymore, then we only have a regular appointment. It's just those individuals regular don't all work full time. Um, they don't want a separate, as I said before, they don't want a separate organizational structure. They don't want separate promotions. They don't want separate compensation benefits or incentives. Um, that goes back to what you refer to as parity, which we have been working. So a lot of what they're asking for to a certain degree already exists. Um, if you remember correctly, you know, I went back and said they want to reduce the transition between full and part-time. Well, we've been wanting it too. In fact, um, uh, DOD spent years uh, working on duty status reform. So Congress or um, DOD worked for years on duty status reform. They put it all together. 
Uh, I think the last I heard, uh, if I remember correctly, they had said over 400 sections or pieces of law end up getting changed. And we got to the point where it was ready um, to go forward and, and then it got hung up. It's hung up in OMB, Office of Management and Budget. Um, we're asking for it to come out. And the reason we're asking for it to come out is to do exactly what they said, reduce transitions, because it's going to reduce what the 34 duty status is into uh, eight categories. So it would make it easier. Um, the, in order to do what they want to do with the force, they said that they're going to adopt talent management practices. Um, the services are already doing that too. And when they talk about talent management practices, um, it's funny if anybody that was in the military for any length of time knows that there's always a buzzword, you know, or a system um, for management, you know, total quality management. Uh, right now it's all talent management practices. And basically talent management practices are really um, making it easier um, to, for people to basically meet their needs to a certain degree, but meet the services needs. And so an example is um, what's happened with warrant officers because there was there's law that also went over at this time about warrant officers. And what it's saying is that warrant officers may not want to promote or may be in a position where they, they like being and so they are passing law that would allow them to not have to go to a promotion board and can basically you know, pull themselves back. And the whole reason for it is that they may need time to finish their degree. You know, they may need um, you know, something going on that needs to be met in their civilian job and they're not ready to, uh, to meet yet. They may want to try to get command under their belt. So that's part of what talent management is. And that is a lot of uh, what they're putting into it or, or is that flexibility, so to speak. So I, as I talked about before, they're established in three categories, active status, uh, which is the regular and ready reserve, what we know is the regular and ready reserve, inactive status, and then retired. Um, if you are in an active status, you're not participating, but you can be um, called up without consent at any time. For um, the movement of forces from the Air Force into space, it disestablishes the regular space force uh, in the Air Force by October 1st, 2027. So it, they're giving themselves um, four years uh, to get there. The training is pretty much the same. So they've done that a lot. They've taken a lot of what's already existing in that regard. Um, it's 48 drills, 14 AT, up to 30 days. So that part doesn't change. I thought this was kind of interesting. For officers, it says that their training requirement is 50 points, but the interesting part was anything above can be assigned to a previous or subsequent year if those years, if either one of those years are lacking. So I thought that was interesting because, I mean, think about it, why not? If the whole point of this training uh, minimum is training and you get it done, sometimes the hardest part is, is getting it done in the right fiscal year and not because the individual isn't getting it done because you know, we end up, we're, we're living with a continuing resolution or the budget doesn't get approved. And so through no fault of the members, they could end up, you know, not getting enough points. Um, another thing that was really interesting is you must be a citizen of the US. And the reason I say that that's interesting is because a lot of the critical career fields um, that are in the army, in particular medical, are done through recruiting of individuals who want to be citizens. And so they recruit into the military and that earns them a path to citizenship. But because of the um, security clearance requirements, space is saying that they cannot, they cannot deal, uh, deal with that or have that as part of it. Um, they are also doing opt out of promotion. 
uh, as I spoke about before, but it has to be in the best interest of Space Force. That's going to be interesting because the best interest of Space Force, that can be that can be subjective. So when they say, you know, best interest of Space Force, are they going to put some objective standards in there? You know, I don't know. Time and grade is going to be the same. Um, Oh, one thing that was interesting, again, is they are no longer going to discharge officers after a two-time Passover. And they will, how they'll handle it is with selective continuation. Um, I didn't read anything about enlisted, but I'm really hoping that they put this concept in for enlisted too. In other words, you know, enlisted shouldn't have to you know, be kicked out after a certain period because they only make staff sergeant um, or E5. It's like, well, if, if they're being effective, they're fine with E5, why can't they stay in and get their 20 to 30 years? So I hope some of those requirements for getting people out of enlisted also go to, um, or in officers uh, go to enlisted and allow them to stay. Because if an individual is doing their job, then, then why can't they stay? Especially, I think a lot of what may be driving this, or hopefully it's they're thinking about it, what's driving it is recruiting is expensive. It's expensive to get them in. It's expensive to train them. There is a much smaller part of the population that can come in. So we need to really start giving more attention to retention and keep the assets, the experience, the leadership that we've developed, keep it longer. I mean, that's really the crux of the reserve anyway in the Guard, is we end up staying longer than active duty. And that gives us that chance on that one system to become an expert that, you know, can deal with any crisis that ends up coming along. So I'm hoping that they think about that, that more uh, and, and come up with it. Again, that is not anywhere near everything that they covered, but hopefully what you'll see, it, it is enough. There's enough difference. Um, there's enough change that Congress will say, no, we're not gonna include it in the 20 uh, fiscal year 2023 NDAA. We're going to move this, this very big legislative package into the 118th and give not only Congress, but the military service organizations, the veteran service organizations, you know, the, the National Guard, the Reserve, everybody a chance to weigh in on all of this. And quite honestly, some of this is so different. There's a part of me that would like to say, can we not do some of this as a pilot before we just jump in? I mean, we're jumping into something we, we have no idea where it may go, but we have enough knowledge uh, and history of what's happened that um, maybe we need to take it slower and, and start letting it play out and see, um, see what's gonna end up happening with it. So thank you for staying with me as we go through that. I hope it wasn't totally boring um, and that you'll join me as we go forward with this legislation and, and maybe not just be so set in the way that things have always been done that we aren't willing to look at ways that it could be done, but also temper with what we have seen in the past. So thank you very much.